I was just remarking this morning as we were practicing how this feels a bit like a Broadway show, <laughs> and Phyllis just played the mashup of like the best hits. So <laughs> that's what you have in store for yourself this morning. Welcome everyone to Unity of Bloomington. Happy Easter. Whether you're here with us in person or online, we're so glad that you're here. Please join with me in speaking our vision statement together. We are a heart-centered community seeking spiritual awakening and transformation by deepening our connections with God, self, and others. And now please stand if you're able and join us in joyful song celebrating the resurrection of Jesus the Christ within. a lot when I'm service leader, but our service today is a little different <laughs> than our normal <sighs> Sunday service. We are joining in a glorious celebration of what Easter truly means in story and song. It's wonderful to start with that Alleluia. I remember growing up in the Catholic Church that Sunday of Easter was the first day of the year that you could say the word Alleluia in the sanctuary. So... Um, in our service today, we'll be moving back and forth between Phyllis and Randy and myself to tell this story in uh, words and song. He was born in an obscure village, the child of a peasant woman. He grew up in still another village where he worked in a carpenter shop until he was 30. Then for three years, he was an itinerant preacher. He never wrote a book. He never held an office. He never had a family or owned a house. He didn't go to college. He never visited a big city. He did none of the things one usually associates with greatness. He had no credentials by himself. He was only 33 when the tide of public opinion turned against him. His friends ran away. He was turned over to his enemies and went through the mockery of a trial. 
He was nailed to a cross between two thieves. While he was dying, his executioners gambled for his clothing, the only property he had on earth. When he was dead, he was laid in a borrowed grave through the pity of a friend. Twenty centuries have come and gone. Today, he is the central figure of the human race and the leader of mankind's progress. All the armies that ever marched, all the navies that ever sailed, all the parliament that ever sat, all the kings that ever reigned put together have not affected the life of man on earth as much as that one solitary life. And today, on Easter Sunday, we gather to look at what Paul Harvey would have called the rest of the story. Those of us who are old enough to remember him. Because there is more to Jesus, more to that one solitary life and the lessons he was here to teach us than what we can even imagine. Last week, Reverend Robin Volker took us through some of the events of Holy Week, the last week of Jesus' life in Jerusalem. Today, we continue that journey, starting with a little longer look at the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus brought his disciples to the garden for a last moment of prayer and reflection before he knew that he would be betrayed and arrested. Every moment of Holy Week reflects the choices that Jesus made. He would have chosen not to even, en he could have chosen not to even enter into Jerusalem. He knew what would happen if he did, yet he made the choice to follow through with what would be an agonizing physical torment. He chose to go to the Garden of Gethsemane, Gethsemane where he and his disciples often prayed and where Judas would be sure to find him. He could have gone somewhere else, somewhere obscure, somewhere they had never gone to pray before. But he made the choice to fulfill the prophecies of the Jewish people. Peace in my life is growing because I choose love. Love's always present, it's what I'm made of. When Jesus prayed in the garden, he started his prayer 
as a very human being. Matthew says that he began to be sorrowful and oppressed. His prayer was, O my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me, but let it be not as I, but as you. I don't really want to do this, but I'm willing to if you want me to. The second time he made that prayer, he said again, O my Father, if this cup cannot pass, and if I have to drink it, let it be according to your will. In other words, if, he, if it has to happen, then let it happen with the divine pulling the strings. He prayed a third time the same words. His very human being did not want to go through the physical torment that he knew would happen, but he was willing to submit, to surrender, putting the divine in charge. Metaphysically, we understand that Jesus was not praying to a father outside of himself, but he was bringing up and connecting to the spiritual divine that was inside of his human shell. His human mind did not want to go forward on the path that he knew was laid out to him, but he connected to the divine within him and brought forth the strength to weather what was to come. He surrendered to the all that is, acknowledging that there was greater strength, greater resilience, greater abilities available to him, allowing his true being to come forth. Thank you. I surrender to the peace. I surrender to the stillness. I surrender to the peace and rest in God. I surrender.
There were two important groups of leaders for the Jewish people, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Pharisees were scholars, the legal experts of Hebrew law. They expected every jot and tittle of the law to be followed. Jesus was dangerous to them because he disobeyed Mosaic law. He disobeyed, obey, uh, sorry, disobeyed Mosaic law when it made sense to him to do so. He did good works on the Sabbath, breaking the law, and encouraged people to think instead of following the law blindly. This was very threatening to the power of the Pharisees that, maintained, that, that they maintained over the people. The Sadducees were high priests in the ruling class. Their power came from the temple and the religious rites that were very important to the Jews, which they said could only be performed in the temple. Jesus taught that spiritual thoughts and activities were within each and every Jew and that their spirituality was based inside of them, not in the temple. So Jesus was dangerous to the Sadducees because he diminished the power that they held over the religious aspect of the Jews. If Jesus convinced them that their spirituality was inside of them, at all times, they could have no need of the temple and therefore no need of the Sadducees. So Jesus was the original power to the people guy, teaching that the real power is inside each and every human being. So there was no need to look outside themselves to anyone else, Pharisees or Sadducees. Obviously, this was a critical danger to the ruling classes. fundamental Christian view of Easter is that Jesus died for our sins. He was put to death as a sacrifice for the rest of mankind, just as the Jews sacrificed lambs and other animals in the temple in order to relieve themselves of responsibility for any sins that they may have committed. But we know that Jesus did not die for our sins. Jesus was put to death because he refused to deny who he was. Let me say that again. Jesus was put to death because he refused to deny who he was. After Jesus was arrested, when he was brought before the high priests, they looked for witnesses against him, and at first they couldn't find any. When they interrogated him and asked him questions, he refused to answer. When they asked, are you the son of God? He first replied, you are the ones who say so. In other words, what do you think? Finally, according to Mark's gospel, he said, I am. And Luke's story says, if I tell you, you will not believe me. He turned it back on them and said, basically, if you think so, then I am. All of which is to say that he refused to deny that he was a son of God. He refused to deny that God lived within him as a part of him and ruled his life. That is why Jesus was crucified, because he was aware of who he was and he refused to deny it. This new way of thinking was very dangerous to the Jewish leaders and they wanted to snuff it out right away before it caught on, before their power was taken away. 
If the people believed that God lived inside of them, then there would be no need for the Mosaic law for any temple rites. Everyone would have that deep connection to all that is at the drop of a hat every day, every minute. And there was absolutely no place for that in the Jewish culture of that day. So Jesus had to go. didn't have the power of life and death, and they had to take Jesus before the Roman leaders to accomplish that. They made their case to Pilate, and Pilate didn't seem to think there was any evidence against him to warrant a death sentence. Jesus didn't present any danger or risk to the Romans. He was just an itinerant preacher. Nobody special or powerful. So Pilate washed his hands of the whole idea and turned Jesus back over to the Jewish leaders, saying, do with him what you will, giving them permission to put him to death, but not taking that responsibility upon the Roman government. At the time of the Passover, it was a tradition for the Roman government to release a prisoner as a gesture of good faith. Pilate offered to release Jesus, but the high priest roused up the people and they asked for Barabbas instead. So Jesus was given over to be crucified. Metaphysically, the cross and the crucifixion itself are usually seen to be the necessity of crossing out negative thinking, of doing away with the negative or completely human aspect of our being, which must happen before we can even think about resurrecting or resurfacing as a more spiritual being. We must die to the physical, quote, and take on the spiritual. As Jesus hung on the cross, he could have given in to the physical aspect of his being. I'm sure he was in great pain. He had nails through his hands and his feet and a crown of thorns on his head. Yet he continued to teach us from the spirit and divinity inside of him. And some of the most important lessons 
that he taught us came from this day. His first lesson from the cross was, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Again, the Father that he was speaking to was calling up the divine within him, and that divinity was forgiving all of those who put him up there on the cross, all of the Pharisees, all of the Sadducees, the centurions who drove the nails, the soldiers who divided his clothes, the one who crafted and hung the king of the Jews sign three in three languages above his head. Everyone who had done him any wrong was forgiven because Jesus knew that no person or no thing really wants to hurt us. When someone does something that hurts us, it really is because he or she doesn't know what they are doing. They don't know from the divine spirit that is within them what they are doing. They have not activated that divine spirit and so are not acting from it. They don't know yet who they are. Therefore, they don't know what they are doing. And Jesus forgave them. There is no higher expression of love in the whole realm of human existence than forgiveness. Jesus was crucified in between two thieves, and the next lesson came from one of them. One of the thieves mocked Jesus and said, if you are truly the Christ, then save yourself and save us. Jesus just ignored him. The other thief basically said, leave him alone. We're up here because we deserve to be. We're suffering the consequences of our own actions. He isn't. Then he asked Jesus to remember him when Jesus came into his kingdom showing that he believed that Jesus was a king. Jesus said to him, truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Metaphysically, Charles Fillmore explains that the three crosses together indicate the past on one side, Jesus as the present, and the future on the other side. The past stands for all of the mistakes that we have made. Our past wants us to keep remembering all of our mistakes, reliving them over and over and over again. But as the here and now consciousness of oneness with God, Jesus ignores the past, just like he ignored the first thief. It is over and done with. The other thief stands for the future, asking to be a part of God's kingdom in the future. Jesus, as the here and now presence says, today, because you believe today, you will be with me in paradise. And we know paradise is not a place, but a state of mind. So, hanging on the cross, 
in physical torment, both Jesus and the thief beside him are in paradise because they are in the spirit of the divine. The lesson here is no matter what our past has been, no matter what concerns we may have about our future, if we acknowledge and connect to the divine within us, in that moment, we can be uplifted, no matter what our physical condition might be. Moment by moment, time upon time, we connect again and again and maintain our divinity through it all, whatever the all might be. Jesus teaches about the interconnectedness, the oneness of us all. He says to Mary, his mother, woman, behold thy son, meaning his disciple John. And to John, he says, behold your mother. They aren't related. There are no genetic family ties between the two of them. Jesus is teaching the responsibility we have toward each other. He taught this earlier in his life when he was asked, who is my mother and who are my brothers? His answer was, whoever does the will of my father in heaven, he is my brother and my sister and my mother. On the cross, Jesus is reteaching the concept that all of us who know who we are, who believe in the divinity within us, belong to each other. He reminds us that we are brothers and sisters and mothers and sons and daughters all together. In time of need and in time of joy, we hold on to each other. You can go ahead and stand and as we sing join together, acknowledge the person next to you as your brother and sister. Sisters join together in peace. We are brothers, we are sisters. 
The next words of Jesus on the cross are often misinterpreted. The traditional Christian translation is, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Conversely, a totally human response for someone finding themselves nailed to a cross close to death would be, why am I up here? Why haven't you saved me from this? If Jesus truly had questioned God and said this, it would have been a victory for his enemies and an end to those who still had some faith in him. But Jesus knew he was more than just human. Dr. George Lamsa, the noted Aramaic scholar, translate these words quite differently. Directly from the Aramaic, which is the language that Jesus actually spoke, direct translation from the Aramaic says, my God, my God, for this I was kept, acknowledging that the place in which Jesus finds himself is his true purpose in life. In his book, My Neighbor Jesus in the Light of His Own Language, People and Times, Dr. Lamser writes, it was, an, it was an announcement of faith in God in the secure confidence that his death would bring the ultimate victory of truth. Since truth is great and it must prevail, the death of Jesus was to transcend physical limitations and make vivid God's revelation of redemption and his, and his eternal purpose through a new beginning to extend his spiritual influence to all mankind. His death, indeed, was the key to open the doors into liberty for all peoples. He continues, a glass of water placed in the Sahara contains all the qualities of water, but it is isolated. Ships cannot sail over this small amount of water, nor can the fish live and swim in it. The moment this water evaporates, it becomes an integral part of all water in the air and in the ocean. So close your eyes for just a minute in meditation and think about this. See a glass of water sitting in the middle of the desert you just saw on the screen. Obviously, it's going to evaporate very quickly, but where does it go? As it evaporates, it becomes a part of something that is much greater, the air surrounding it. See the evaporation of the water into the surrounding air. Watch the air as it travels across the land and finally comes to an ocean. Envision the air over the ocean becoming heavy with raindrops and falling down upon the vast sea. The waves move in and out through storm and silence. Many miles and many days later, watch as those same molecules evaporate again into the air. Now they travel towards the land. As they continue on their journey, storm clouds gather, and those very same molecules that started in the middle of a desert now are streaming down as rain that nourishes a crop of tomatoes or corn or wheat. A small, isolated glass of water becomes nourishment for something else many miles away. Just as the spirit of one isolated being, Jesus of Nazareth, when it rose to become part of the greater all that is, became nourishment for all of us. You may open your eyes. Dr. Lamsa goes on to say, such it is with man who is alive physically, but is isolated spiritually until he comes in contact with other spirits. This is how Jesus thought of his death. It was an ending of his physical part, but a large beginning of his spiritual personality. His death was the fulfillment of his destiny. For this I was kept. One of the centurions surrounding Jesus had a hand in teaching the next lesson. Jesus said, I thirst. A soldier dipped a sponge into vinegar, put it on a pole, and lifted it to Jesus' lips so that he could drink. 
Now, there are two ways of looking at what he did. The totally human way of looking at it might say that he was mocking Jesus and and deliberately answering him with something that would be distasteful and sour. That's one way of looking at it. From another standpoint, though, the answer to his request was supplied in the best way possible from the resources available. Maybe there wasn't any water. I have no idea why vinegar would be available at a crucifixion, but apparently it was. Maybe the soldier was trying to do the right thing and give Jesus whatever he could to help his thirst, which unfortunately was vinegar, but it was wet. It was what he had available. One physical, one metaphysical interpretation has been that no matter how much it looks like there is absolutely no good in your life, no matter how unpromising the outer appearances may be, maybe it looks like only vinegar is available. If you really and truly feel a need for good in your life, acknowledge that need, voice it, put it into words, and you will get a response if you say it with faith. Jesus voiced his need and got a response from the very people executing him. And ask and you shall receive. Seek it with faith and even the most unlikely channel could be activated to accomplish the good that you are seeking. Jesus then said, it is finished. He recognized that this piece of his life on this planet was over. He acknowledged that he had completed one phase of learning and was ready to grow into a new dimension of consciousness. If we follow his example, we too must recognize when we are finished with our old way of life, just being human, and ready to begin a new with a spiritual foundation. But we must make a decision to complete the old before we can fully put on the new. Jesus taught this in many parables. You can't mend an old coat with a new piece of cloth. You can't put new wine and old wineskins. Jesus was finishing his human life and gearing up to fully take on his spiritual life. And his very last words on the cross show the choice he made. He made the choice as to when to leave this physical life. It didn't happen to him. He made the choice. He said, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. These words are another way of saying, Father God, regardless of how I feel, what I think, what I look like, or what I'm going through right now, I am eternally one with you and all the good that you are always and I commit myself, my very soul, into your keeping. According to the gospel that you read, he either gave up the ghost or yielded up his spirit. But nowhere does it say that he died. In other words, Jesus raised his consciousness into the next highest dimension of being. He made the choice to remove his divine spirit 
from its physical shell and evaporate into the greater all that is. Just like the glass of water in the Sahara, and just like the molecules of water, the divine spirit of Jesus then becomes nourishment for something else or someone else. He is now completely free from the limitations of time, space, and circumstances that exist in our physical human world. His spirit has risen into higher consciousness. Jesus has committed his spirit to a higher consciousness, but his body still exists on this plane. It was very close to the beginning of the Sabbath for the Jews, which runs from sunset on Friday evening to sunset on Saturday evening. By Mosaic law, no work can be done during the Sabbath, including preparing a body for burial. So Joseph of Arimathea, a rich follower, asked for Jesus' body and placed him in a new tomb that was carved out of rock, a tomb that had never been used, waiting for the Sabbath to be over so that the body could be prepared for burial. A large stone was rolled in front of the entrance to the tomb, sealing it. Now, when Jesus was before the, now, when Jesus was before the high priest in his trial for the crucifixion, one of the witnesses remembered that in his early teachings, when Jesus drove the money changers out of the temple, he said, tear down this temple, and in three days, I will raise it up. Even then, early in his ministry, he spoke of raising up or resurrecting his body, the physical temple of his divine spirit after three days. The Jewish leaders remembered this and asked Pilate for guards around the tomb so that the disciples couldn't pull a fast one and steal the body away and say, look, he's not there, he has risen. Pilate basically said, hey, that's your job. So the priests set out a couple of guards outside of the tomb during the Sabbath to make sure that no one came and stole the body away. Drive the nails in my hands, laugh at me where you stand. Go ahead and say it isn't me. The day will come when you will see. Go ahead 
and mock my name. My love for you is still the same. Go ahead and bury me, but very soon I will be free. But you will see that you were wrong. Go ahead and try to hide the sun. But all will see that I'm the during the Sabbath, while Jesus was in the tomb, is important. We don't see anything about it in the scriptures, but it was a time of waiting, a time of silence, a time of in-between. That in-between time is important, is crucial in some things. When a caterpillar turns into a butterfly, it goes from one physical form, the caterpillar, into another very different form, a butterfly. How does that happen? The in-between time makes it happen. The caterpillar becomes goo in the chrysalis, and that goo reforms into something completely different, a butterfly. And that butterfly has to work hard to escape from the chrysalis to become its next form. A chicken is another example. An egg is laid that has only components inside of it, a yolk, a sticky substance, and chemicals. Gradually, in time, in the silence, in the process of life, it becomes a chick, something totally different. And that chick has to work hard to peck out of the shell that surrounds it, to give it new life in a totally different place. Both of those are good metaphors for the second day in the tomb. The chrysalis and the egg are necessary in-between stages before the result we are waiting for actually happens. Unity of Bloomington is in that in-between stage right now. We are a different community from what we were even six months ago. We are in the in-between time between the germ cells, the beginnings, and the next step in the process. Because it is a process, and we must trust that process. Jesus did. In the silence of the second day in the tomb, Jesus became Jesus became more. He gave up his spirit on the cross, and during that in-between time in the tomb, he became something, someone else, that his followers did not recognize when they saw him next. The in-between time, the silence, is crucial. No. 
In the silence, Jesus found God. He found himself. He found and became the resurrected being that is in the next step in the process. Most people think of a tomb as a final resting place, a gloomy and a dark end. I might suggest that you look at it more as a portal. If you're a Star Trek science fiction fan, you know the phrase, beam me up, Scotty or it could possibly be in the Stargate series, that great big circle that you step into and it takes you somewhere else. Your human atoms are all scrambled up and then put back together in a new fashion, a resurrected fashion with new light and new power and new authority. The tomb, the end of physical limitations, is only a portal with light and a new awakening in the end of the tunnel. After the Sabbath, when Jesus' followers came to prepare his body for burial, there are different tellings of the story in the different Gospels as to who found him, whether he was there, or whether an angel told them he had risen, whether the stone was already rolled away, or an angel rolled it away. The stories are slightly different in all the Gospels, but the meaning of it all is that we are more than just human. When we acknowledge, connect with, and access the divine that is within us as Jesus did, we overcome our physical life. The, resurrect, the resurrection is the conscious knowledge that I am a spiritual being and that all things are in, a, in essence spiritual. As Paul says in his letter to the Corinthians, I die daily. We must die to our human self moment by moment and remember, resurrect, and restore the divine that is within us, moment by moment. Every time we come into the resurrection to the understanding of our spiritual being, we lift ourselves up. We remove all the limitations we've placed upon ourselves. We roll away the stone of ignorance and unbelief 
so that understanding and the fullness of our divine self can come forth. Jesus provided the example for us all. He was not a special case. He provided the example that proved the potential that is inside of all of us. Fundamentally, Easter is the story of the symbol of the hidden divine within each of us. Jesus actually reached his potential. Everything that exists has potential and has a number of stages before that potential is reached. Think about a tomato seed. It changes from a tiny seed to a delicate sprout to a full-blown plant. Then it blossoms, and those blossoms turn into tomatoes. Looking at that tiny seed, can you see the potential for a red, ripe, juicy tomato? It's there. We have that same potential. What are we? What are you? You are what you can be. The Easter story, the resurrection of Jesus, proves that you and I can become what we are at our core, divine beings. To be resurrected means to get out of the place where you are and go on to a higher plane, to awaken your freedom from false beliefs, and we have that opportunity to be resurrected every moment of every day. It is not restricted to only one day a year, an Easter celebration. The resurrection of your divine soul happens in every moment that we awaken to who we really are. When we awaken to all the power and authority that we have as a spiritual being. Yeah. 
I'm awake. <laughs> <laughs> we prepare now to show our gratitude for what we continue to receive. There are several ways to contribute to Bloomington of Unity. Checks or cash are always welcome. Or you can use the text to give button on the screen or the donate button. As the offering bags are passed around, you may want to pass your hand over as give a blessing. For those in the audience, we want you to fill out the blue visitor forms that are in the pocket chair and give us your first impression. Prayer request forms are also available in the pocket. Both of these forms may be dropped into the offering bags that has passed. If I may now call the greeters up. Thank you, you're already there. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. <laughs> Just reading my script. <laughs> Um, we have the abundance affirmation, if you would please. I am an abundant being, an abundant universe. I am not dependent on people or situations for my good. God is the source of my supply. I always have something to give and I consistently give it. I expect the best, I give my best, and I now attract the best in every experience. offerings with this with these words divine, divine love flowing through, through me blesses, blesses and multiplies all that I have all that I give and all that I receive and I am grateful thank you um, lots of announcements today and let me get to where I need to be Okay, uh, Easter egg hunt, love it. Uh, the kiddos are gonna come up here for the peace song, and then the hunt itself is gonna be indoors. We'd like for the parents to stay with the kiddos, so if you'll go back downstairs after the peace song, um, and our helpers, Makai and Ethel, are setting that up. Um, our music director, Phyllis Wycliffe, has committed to attend the 2024 Posse Music Festival at Unity Village the last week in June. You may applaud. <laughs> the Board of Trustees is sponsoring her registration fee. If you'd like to contribute to her lodging and travel expenses, we're happy to accept any designated gifts you might like to give. Please designate Music Festival on your gift. And it's my pleasure to give you all an update on what's happening in the world of the ministerial search. 
We've completed the vetting process for three candidates, and they are all very strong candidates. We've scheduled Zoom interviews with each one, so as you see the upcoming speakers, you'll see some of their names start to, to come up because the interviews will take place as part of Sunday services on April the 14th, 21st, and 28th. So what that means is when you come to those services on those Sundays, the message will be given by that person, and then we'll go direct, after their meditation, we'll go directly into interviewing them. The members of the search team, which are Phyllis, myself, Mary Ellen, Tana, and Leanne, will be asking them questions. You all will be able to look on, and we're recording it. If you're not able to attend the service on that day, then you can see it later. Then we will let, release the candidate from the Zoom and continue with, uh, to close our service. We'll have a little break for snacks and socializing. And then we'll stay, so plan on being here longer than normal on those Sundays. We'll stay and have a facilitated discussion with our board president, Joni Spain, to capture your impressions. And again, if you weren't able to attend in person, We'll distribute the link to a recording of both the Sunday service where the person spoke and gave a meditation in their interview, as well as the discussion with the community. We'll send those out with an online form, a link to an online form so that you can send your impressions of the candidate. Let me make sure that I covered everything. Oh yeah, okay. So what do you do right now? How do you prepare? Never fear, your search committee has thought of these things. Um, so we've compiled information on each candidate for your review, what to expect during the interviews, and how to participate. You can find this information in a number of different ways. One, next week, at the early part of next week, look for an email that says, Preparing for Ministry Candidate Interviews. You'll find information on each candidate, some links to talks that they've given if you wanna get a sneak peek into what they're like. If they have their own website, there's a link to that as well. So that's one way, email. Another way is within the newsletter, there will be a section titled Preparing for Ministry Candidate Interviews. The third way, if you're here now, we have printed copies of what's in the email. So if you're not an email person, grab a hard copy and you can read some things about the, the candidates. And then finally, this is brand new. Seb has done a ton of work on a new section of the web website called the Member Hub. Information on where to find that section of the website as well as the password. It is password protected, because this is just for our little community, our growing community, small but mighty community. <laughs> um, so you, you'll be able to get the latest and greatest information. So if you're like, where, does, where is that email? I can't find the newsletter. You can always go to the member hub. We're leveraging it right now for this very exciting part of our evolution. In the future, it will be lever leveraged for other reasons as well. There will be a member directory, and I'm sure we'll have a presentation in the future about all of the features of the, the member hub. But let's give a round of applause to Seb for all that work. As always, if after reading the email, the newsletter, the hard copy up here, all the different ways you can find this information, um, and you still have questions, please reach out to the members of the search team, and if you'll raise your hands again, me, Phyllis, Mary Ellen, Tana, and Leanne. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, upcoming speakers. On the 7th, we have David Brown, our most important relationship, and then those following three Sundays are our candidates, our ministerial candidates. Um, now, 
Now, if you would please stand, if that's available to you, and join me in the prayer for protection. Together, the light of God surrounds us, the love of God enfolds us, the power of God protects us, the presence of God watches over us. Wherever we are, God is, and all is well. Thank you. And before we go into the peace song, I just also want to recognize Phyllis for the work in putting the service together. You may have noticed there were a lot of moving parts, and she fit them together like the puzzle master that she is. Thank you. And when you're ready, please start to uh, join together in a large circle today.